get down here early. The House will come to order. Members, please take your seats. Sergeant Arms. The House of Delegates is now in session. All persons not entitled to privileges of the floor, please retire to the gallery. The members will rise and be led in prayer by the Reverend Robert D. Smith, pastor of First Presbyterian Church, Roanoke, and remain standing for the pledge to the flag of the United States of America, led by the gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Let us bow our heads together in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, creator and sustainer of all that is, you alone are sovereign. And so we turn to you, confessing a need that only you can satisfy. Grant an incomparable wisdom to all who serve in this house, that the laws established here will be reflective of your will, firmly grounded in your truth, and thus enabled to promote great liberty. May the legislation forged here through deep debate and careful consideration be characterized by genuine justice, not only for some, but for all. May the work produced by these men and women promote the public good and serve as an effective restraint upon those whose intentions are bent towards evil. O God of all nations, help each representative remember that their first obligation in this chamber is not to their constituents, but rather it is to you, for they hold a sacred trust to govern in righteousness, to promote peace, and to establish order in society. Bless them with a spirit of civility, such that they are able to conduct themselves with honor in all that they do and say. Grant them a spirit of cooperation that motivates them to find solutions to the challenges that confront us in these most trying times. And may their lives be characterized by such a spirit of service that they are more concerned about accomplishing great things than they are with gaining great recognition. All this I pray in the name of Christ the Lord. Amen. The members will answer the roll call by indicating their presence on the electronic voting board. <laughs> Clerk will close the roll. Mr. Speaker, a quorum is present. <clears throat> Pursuant to House Rule 3, I've examined and approved the Journal of the House of Delegates for January 14, 2013. The House will come to order. Motions and resolutions under Rule 39 are now in order. Does the clerk have any announcements or communications? Not at this time, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> uh, the clerk will report House Joint Resolution 729. House Joint Resolution 729, Election of Circuit Court Judges, General District Court Judges, Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court Judges, and the Auditor of Public Accounts. The uh, gentleman from Rock Ridge, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I urge adoption of the resolution. If any favor adoption of the resolution will say aye. Aye. If those opposed, no. That motion is agreed to. The gentleman from Rockbridge will communicate the House's action to the Senate.
The uh, gentleman from Lunenburg, Mr. Wright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise for an introduction, please. The gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, it's my pleasure to announce today that we have visiting with us at the Capitol the students from South South Virginia Community College, the John Daniel Campus. I'd ask them to stand. Also, we have today the members of the staff, and they are accompanied also by Dr. Elizabeth Elam, the Dean of Instruction. Uh, we should join me in giving them a warm House of Delegates welcome. Thank you. The gentleman from Arlington, Mr. Hope. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for the point of personal privilege. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, today I've introduced a resolution that seeks to extend Medicaid coverage to several hundred thousands of Virginia's poor citizens as envisioned under the Affordable Care Act. But this resolution is not as simple as just that. Extending Medicaid without adequate safeguards and sustainable reforms would be a huge mistake. And reforming Medicaid without extending it would be a very costly error. We must do both. For four years, I've had the privilege of being in this chamber, and for four years, I've heard four State of the State addresses from Governor McDonnell. And I believe it's at least three out of the four he has made the statement, and he repeated it again this time, that Medicaid has grown an unsustainable 1,600% over the last 30 years and gone from 5% of our budget to now 21% of our budget. This figure is absolutely correct and true not just for Virginia, but for every state in our country. It is an unsustainable program, and we need to act now. This resolution I've introduced, Mr. Speaker, supports reforming Medicaid, making it sustainable, and redesigning the system to make it more efficient, improve quality, and lower costs. It also supports what Governor McDonnell has called for, asking for more flexibility and broader state authority over the program. And it conditions continued support on promised federal resources being there in the future. Mr. Speaker, we are in complete agreement. I would say to you, the only way to reform the system is through extent, extension. We need to use these federal dollars wisely and use them in such a way that can truly transform the system. We have an opportunity to do some things that we've not been able to do before, Mr. Speaker. And if you're worried about the cost of extension, as you should be, and as we all are, nothing compares to the cost of doing nothing. Think of the 1,600% over the last 30 years. But let's do this in a responsible manner. Let's not squander this opportunity to do what we all want to do, cover more Virginians, make needed reforms to ensure the sustainability of the program, improve our economy, and lower costs. Democrats and Republicans should do this together. Mr. Speaker, I sincerely hope leadership will take a serious look at this resolution that I introduced today. There is talk about this being just a decision made by the Appropriations Committee. This would be a shame. What better message can we send to the Obama administration to ask for broad state flexibility to take more control over our Medicaid program? Please give every member of this body the chance to overwhelmingly send this bipartisan message to Washington. Mr. Speaker, I sincerely hope you will support this resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, gentleman from Richmond City, Ms. McQuinn. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning, Mr. Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the House. I want to share with you a concern I have about the governor's transportation proposal. As I understand his plan, Mr. Speaker, the governor is proposing to shift the burden of paying for roads in Virginia from those who use the roads to all Virginians, regardless of whether they use the road or how much they may use them. This bill really challenges the pocketbook and the resource of a people who use alternative ways to get around rather than driving. It affects low-income households because they have to pay the sales tax any time that they have to purchase anything. 
And so low income households purchasing their essential needs are supporting the use of services that they may not be using. The gas tax is effective because it is a user fee. Those who user tax, those who use the road more frequently will pay a higher tax. This includes the 30% of people out of state that use the Virginia roads. This tax has placed a greater strain on Virginians everywhere and in relieving the people who merely travel through the state. High income earners will not be as severely impacted because their funds can withstand the tax increase. For decades here in Virginia and in every other state, the thinking has been that if you use the roads and bridges, you should pay for them. And that's how the gas tax got started. Use the roads a lot, you're going to use more gas and pay for taxes for the roads. If you don't use the roads or burn much gas, then you pay less. It is a user fees. Under the governor's proposal, during an extremely tight time for all Virginians, every man, woman, and child in Virginia will be paying for a road every time they buy something covered by the sale tax. It does not matter if they travel 10 miles a week or 1,000 miles, they'll be paying the same. It does not matter if they're driving a gas guzzle, SUV, or an economy car, they will be paying the same amount of sale tax on what they buy. Regardless of whether they buy has anything to do with the roads, this proposal put an unnecessary burdens on all citizens, especially those who are already struggling. Mr. Speaker, why would we shift from the gas tax user fee to raising taxes for everyone? When we talk about the sales tax, we call it regressive. The people in my district call it unfair. When they step up to the cash register, they have to pay at the same tax rate as the person in front of them who may make 10 times as much as they do, or the person behind them who make half as much. During these economic times, tough economic times, there are many people who barely have enough income to purchase the essentials of life for their household. And for many of my constituents, this tight height will force them to exceed their bi-weekly and even monthly budget. Mr. Speaker, I would hope that the governor and all of us will see the unfairness in what is being proposed and how people will be burdened and affected by this. The governor calls his proposal bold. Again, my constituent calls it unfair. And something else that puzzles me, Mr. Speaker, is why the governor is moving from the gas tax as a user fee, when in many areas he's going to tolls as a user fee. In Portsmouth and Chesapeake and Sussex and Northern Virginia, he's using toll to let the users of the roads pay for them. This idea of having the sale tax pay for the road is going in the opposite direction. I would hope that the governor will see the unfairness of the tax hike that he's proposing to keep our current use and keep our current user fee system in place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Virginia Beach, Mr. Perkey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, would you request permission to take center aisle? And uh, I'd ask also to pull up uh, HR 119. It's already been adopted by the House. Uh, permission granted. Thank you. The uh, clerk will report a resolution. House Resolution 119, commending William Lee Owen, agreed to by the House on January 10th. If I can, Mr. Beach. Speaker, I would like to uh, ask uh, Delegate Putney, Plum, and Tata to join me here. They are the only ones and myself who were here when Bill started here in the House. So if you all would join me, I would certainly appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you why we're here today. We're here to honor Bill Owen. Bill Owen has been our incredible clerk in finance for many years. But let me tell you a little bit about this wonderful gentleman. Bill Owen's military service was 1942 to 1946. He left the military and came here to go to work. If you look, he originally volunteered for the service U.S. Coast Guard. He joined the Naval Air Corps and attended pre-flight uh, training in Anacosta Naval Air Station, left the Navy to get married, re-entered the service a week later as a member of the Army Air Force. He served as an instructor pilot in the Army Air Corps for the duration of World War II. He ferried many planes uh, to Europe, 
but uh, really he joined the Virginia Department of Transportation as an engineer following his release from the service in 1946. He worked for the Department of Transportation from 1946 to 1986. He became a he had